hello, everybody. Uh, it's a bit difficult to talk after this magnificent video made by Katayun and Sina. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you to CUNY Center for providing us this opportunity. Um, more than two years have passed since 2009 presidential election. News on Iran is not anymore about people's uprisings. Iranian nuclear issue overshadows the rest. The United States and European Union have imposed unprecedented sanctions and are threatening Iran with military aggression, hurting the lives of average Iranians. But one might ask, what happened to the Green Movement? What were its roots and demands? How can we understand marches of millions of Iranians in the aftermath of 2009 presidential election and now empty streets of 2012? Did people lose their hope? or are they still resisting? What does resistance mean and how does it look like considering the new social and political realities of Iranian lives? I will shed more light on these questions tonight. Since constitutional revolution beginning in 1905 and establishment of second parliament in Asia after the Ottoman Empire, to the resentment against colonial occupation of Iran during world wars, to the popular discontent against British imperialism in the movements for nationalization of oil industry in the 1940s and early 50s, to the uprisings against US-backed dictatorship of Shah regime and 1979 revolution, Iranians have been fighting against two evils, despotism or estebdad and colonialism or estemar. With 1979 revolution and overthrown of the pro-West Pahlavi monarchy, Iranians more or less succeeded in decolonizing the country and actualizing one of their two historical demands. We gain independence, estaglal, from imperial powers. But the other goal, freedom, even though was echoed on the streets all over the country, remained untouched. In fact, the Iranian 1979 spring did not last for more than a few weeks. In the grip of the chaos of revolution followed by an imposed catastrophic eight-year war with Iraq, a cold winter started. Only in the bloody red summer of 1988, more than 4,000 political dissidents got executed in the yard of the Iranian Guantanamo, the notorious Evin prison. Nevertheless, representing the Iranian government as an Islamo-fascist regime ruled by mullahs is a distorted, reductive, and orientalist image of what we know as Islamic Republic. It denies the complexities of dynamics of politics and existence of different fractions in the Iranian government and overshadows people's resistance for ideological and political purposes. Neither has every single government in Iran been the same since 1979, nor have people been silently oppressed. Iranians' collective social experience cannot easily forget the reformist era of President Mohammad Khatami, whose political and economical reform, which was a direct response to people's direct struggles, allowed Iranians enjoy less social restrictions freer consumption of public space, freer press, and narrower gap between the rich and the poor, which consequently seeded the relatively fertile ground for student, women, and labor movements to increase their organizational capacities, initiate grassroots campaigns, and challenge the hegemony of the system. However, one has to admit that even during times when the political and social climate was not excessively overclouded, the oppression did not cease. The widespread and systematic violation of human dignity of women, students, laborers, ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities, journalists, lawyers, intellectuals, filmmakers, musicians, and political dissidents has been an inseparable part of the realities of Iranian social and political life, not only since 1979 and establishment of Islamic Republic, but also during the Pahlavi regime, whose national intelligence and security organization, SAVAK, backed and supported by CIA, did not miss any chance to prosecute dissidents. It is within this socio-political context that we have to understand the post-2009 presidential election uprisings. What was unfolded in the aftermath of 2009 election, which is globally known as the Green Movement, is a non-violent civil rights movement constituted of, but could not be reduced to, student, women and labor's movements, and is rooted in more than a hundred year struggle of Iranians for freedom and social and economic justice. It cannot be understood within the false binary opposition of Islamism and secularism or tradition and modernity or Islam and the West, but invoking Hamid Dabashi's terminology, Green Movement is an active retrieval of Iran's historically repressed cosmopolitan political culture. 
It does not necessarily aim at overthrowing the ruling regime, although it might happen sooner or later, but is a struggle towards institutionalizing and securing civil liberties. It is the antithesis of Islamization of Iranian culture by Islamic Republic, an antithesis of top-down westernization by the Pahlavi monarchy. The Green Movement started with the simple question of where is my vote, which was not only a response to the fraudulent election, but was a historical call for the revival of the collective human dignity of Iranians, which has been denied to them for decades. After the violent bloody onslaught of millions of protesters and arbitrary arrest of thousands by security apparatus of Islamic Republic, the focus of the slogans in the streets, alleys, and apartment rooftops gradually shifted to where are prisoners of conscience and where is my brother and where is my sister. Later, in the midst of the unfolding of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions, brave Iranians who have been source of inspiration for their Arab counterparts risked their freedom and lives to directly address the supreme leader to follow the fate of the overthrown dictators. The slogan, Mubarak bin Ali, it's now time for Sayyid Ali, straightforwardly epitomized the direct link between the Arab Spring and the Green Movement. I was in Iran in summer 2009. As the world bird witness to our historic march towards democratic self-governance, Islamic Republic unleashed a brutal crackdown. Thousands got arrested, forced to make false confessions under the gaze of state TV cameras, punished to lengthy prison sentences, tortured, even raped and killed by bullets in the streets or by rope around their neck in the yard of Evin prison. More than a year has passed since February 14, 2011, which was the last time Iranians marched in mass numbers. Since then, militarization of the streets and the widespread terror generated by the propaganda machinery of the state apparatus have helped the garrison state to reclaim the streets and halt public demonstrations. The new dictator is standing on the scene with the companion of his militant orchestra, albeit he is being laughed at by the audience for his banality. Oppression does not cease and resistance continues, not necessarily in the form of public demonstrations, but in various alternative forms. Tonight, tonight that we are sitting in this room, is the 37th day that Mohammad Reza Mu'tamed Nia is on hunger strike. Just like 2,000 Palestinian political prisoners who objected the administrative detention and the apartheid. Mohammad Reza Mu'tamed Nia, the 62-year-old political activist and veteran who fought for 1979 revolution and defended Iran in Iran-Iraq war, is protesting against ongoing house arrest of Mir Hussein Musavi Zahra Rahnavard and Mehdi Karubi, the symbolic leaders of the Green Movement. Mohammad Reza Mu'tamed Nia is following the path of the Iranian Bobby Sons, Hoda Saber, who dedicated his priceless life for his beliefs in June 2011, and whose valor and devoutness still echoes in the shared collective memory of resistance of prisoners at Evin Prison. Tonight, that we are sitting in this room, the recently arrested Nargis Mohammadi, is in critical health condition in the women's ward of Evin Prison. A 40-year-old diligent peace activist and co-founder of Defender of Human Rights Center, Nargis Mohammadi has been sentenced to six years in prison for violating national security and making propaganda against the regime in her articles. She's suffering from an undiagnosed epilepsy-like disease which causes her to lose control over her muscles temporarily during the day. Although she had the opportunity to leave Iran with her husband, a month ago, Nargis Mohammadi decided to stay in country, defend the lost goals of 1979 revolution, and simply to fight for a life with dignity and honor. Her two small children are now living with their grandmother. Tonight that we are sitting in this room, Reza Shahabi, a labor union activist and co-founder of Syndicate of Workers of Tehran and Suburbs Bus Company, is serving the second year of a six-year prison sentence for publicly defending the right to assemble and objecting wage cuts, unpaid salaries, bad working conditions, and ongoing harassment of detention and detention of his colleagues at the Bus Drivers Union. On May 1st, 2012, Reza Shahabi issued a statement from Evin Prison. He addressed people and all independent labor unions across the world, asserting, here I am protesting against poverty, discrimination, exploitation, and violation of human rights. I was detained because of demanding justice for bus drivers, 
but I stand in solidarity with all journalists, students, and women who are fighting for their freedom." End quote. Tonight, we are sitting in this room, and the stories of oppression and concomitant resistant, resistance against the garrison state continues. Prisoners and their families are under pressure to ask a supreme leader to forgive them for their non-committed crimes, but they stand on the principles. They write open and public letters from jail and boycott illegitimate court trials. In other words, prisoners refuse to have their collective wills broken. They have transformed prison into a site of resistance. Just yesterday, the 57-year-old political activist Masoud Pedram went on hunger strike to protest against the solitary confinement. But not all forms of resistance are visible and public. There are various kinds of action done by ordinary people which happen off stage and beyond direct observation of the rulers. These are the forms of disguised low profile practices or what James Scott calls infrapolitics, which are not substitute for the direct public confrontation in the streets, but are silent partners of loud form of public resistance. They include distributing underground newspapers, decorating walls of a street with symbols, and signs of the green movement economically and can rather like snowflakes on the deep mountainside set off an avalanche. These stories of resistance are at best neglected or at worst repressed. Neither mainstream Western media nor the alternative leftist ones show interest in covering these stories. The former got upset with failure of green movement in toppling the Islamic Republic and is now reducing the image of Iran to the image of mullahs, Ahmadinejad, and alike by obsessively covering the news of nuclear talks, while the latter, our leftist friends, incapable of understanding the social and historical underpinnings of the Green Movement, sometimes categorically dismiss it as a US-funded colorful revolution. Both of these representations are reductive distortions of the multifaceted Iranian cosmopolitan culture within which the Green Movement is breathing. Iranians are neither a victim in need of humanitarian military strikes to be liberated, nor players of a CIA plot. In fact, despite state oppression, not only most Iranians are not embracing foreign intervention, but several prominent Iranian grassroots activists and members of the opposition have raised their voices to categorically object warmongering of Israel and Western warmongers and the illegitimate unethical and inhumane sanctions imposed on Iranian people. A good example of this objection is epitomized in Mir Hossein Musav's statement opposing the Security Council resolution in 2010. Mir Hossein, who himself fought against US-backed Shah regime in the 60s and 70s, is today spending his 457th day under house arrest. Despite his controversial past, he has stayed faithful to the principles, ethics, and values of the Green Movement. Before his arrest, he asserted, quote, sanctions are not designed to bring the government to its knees. If we look back at the experience of August 19, 1953, when the democratically elected Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, was toppled by a CIA coup, and the bitter fate of Iraq and Afghanistan, and a bitter fate of Iraq and Afghanistan in contemporary history, it should serve as a clear warning that some governments see their survival in the continuation of this crisis. It is up to the Green Movement to create reconciliation by remaining true to its principles while confronting the clear risk. Resistance to potential foreign threats and invasion is a necessity. The Green Movement should use its influence and power in the international arena to show foreign powers that it will not allow them to take advantage of the weakness and illegitimacy of current ruling government and harm the territorial integrity and interest of our nation. I would like to end by invoking the bravery and the strength of my two close friends, Ali Akbar Mohammad Zadeh and Bahare Hedayat. Ali Akbar, the 23-year-old student activist, was arrested in the aftermath of Egyptian and Tunisian revolutions on February 14, 2011. After spending several months in solitary confinement, Ali did not cooperate 
with security forces the way they wished. Consequently, he was sentenced to six, year, six years in prison. He was then asked to sign a letter asking for mercy from top officials to get released. He refused to do so. Now he's serving his six-year imprisonment. Bahare Hedayat, the 29-year-old women's rights and student activist, had the same fate. She has been sentenced to nine and a half years in prison, but did not ask for mercy. Security apparatus of Islamic Republic intends to disempower Ali and Bahare. But their resistance, among the resistance of many others at the time of crippling sanctions and state repression, have become a source of inspiration, empowerment for Iranians, and hopefully for all people around the globe, in Palestine, in America, in Egypt, in Syria, and elsewhere, who are fighting for a life with dignity and honor. Thank you. Thank you.